Hey, it's great to have all of you with us today, all of our churches. I'm curious, how many of you want a little divine direction? Every one of our churches, we are in part three of a four-part message series called Divine Direction. Honestly, as a pastor, the most commonly asked question that I get over and over again is how do I know what God wants for my life? Divine direction. Next week is my favorite of all four weeks. I believe it's the most important. And uh, trust me, this is one that will speak to you and encourage you. Uh, a key line from the book is this that is really important, is that we'll make our decisions and our decisions make us. Who are we today? We're really a result of the decisions that we've made in the past. Who will we be in the future? Who, what we decide today will determine who we are and what we become. We make our decisions, our decisions make us. The decisions that we make today determine the story that we'll tell tomorrow. The big challenge is that many people today are not great decision makers. In fact, uh, the problem of indecisiveness is a growing problem. And we talked about some of the reasons. Week one, we talked about that there are so many options today that it's really difficult to make decisions when you have so many options. Last week, we talked about the illusion of perfection. We are a generation now that has glimpses into people's lives via social media. Their life looks perfect. Our life appears to suck. And so we want this perfect life. We talk about the perfect will of God. We want the perfect will of God. And we have this illusion of perfection. We don't want to make an imperfect decision. And so often we're paralyzed. We make no decision. Another reason why people struggle with making decisions, according to my research, is what they call over-programming kids. We've over-programmed kids. For example, those of you who are maybe my age, when we were growing up, we didn't have a cell phone to hypnotize us, right? We didn't have it. And so our parents would say, go outside and do what? Go outside and play. This is really like a pretty cool thing that we might want to bring back. I don't know, it's, uh, maybe. Go outside and play. And so we had to decide what to do all day long outside. In other words, let's climb on the hill. I'll push you off. We'll call that a game. I decided that. And so there was a lot of decision. Now what researchers are saying is that we have told them what to do, but get, have not given them freedom to decide. You're going here, you're going here, you're going here. So many activities that we've over-programmed them and they haven't really developed the decision-making muscle. And so now we have a lot of people that really battle with indecisiveness. For example, I was talking to a younger staff member that was trying to make a decision between one role or another role and he was really, really struggling. And so I just kind of asked, uh, really sincerely, do you think you battle with indecisiveness? Are you indecisive? And he looked at me dead serious, no, no joke at all. And he said, well, yes and no. <laughs> and then he went on for about five minutes to try to explain to me why he couldn't really figure out if he was indecisive or not. <laughs> and this is an issue now that is a plaguing not just the emerging generation, but so many of us. In fact, I read an article in Forbes about something that's called career paralysis, career paralysis, and that the generation in their 20s now is often so afraid to make a mistake in their career that they don't know what to do. And so I'm like, forgive me if I'm crazy into this, but I'm crazy into this. I love to understand the why behind the what. And so I dug into it a little bit more, and this totally makes sense to me. Um, my generation was raised by, uh, my parents were children of the Depression era. And so what they told us was, get a good education so you can get a good job. How many of you are my age and you, you're like, get a good education? So, you get a good. so basically, if you could get an education, you did. If you couldn't, you didn't, and you were disappointed. Get a good education, get a good job. So that's what we did. A lot of my generation didn't really love their job. And so my generation said to my kids' generation, what do you love to do? What are you excited about? What are you passionate about? So the emerging generation now basically has three criteria before they're going to take a job. It's got to be something that I love good luck, it's not always there, but something that I love, something that makes a difference, and something that makes a lot of money. Something I love, something that makes a difference, something that makes a lot of money. And when they can't find all three, they move back home, sorry, that's why they're in your home, because they don't want to make a decision to settle for less 
than the best, the illusion of perfection. And this is what happens to me, and this is what happens to all of us. I want the very best. I'm afraid if I take that, I have to say no to this opportunity, this opportunity, this opportunity, this opportunity, and my fear of missing out over there keeps me from committing over here. An uncommitted life is always an unsuccessful life, and this is how the fear or the indecisive problem is actually impacting so many people. So how do we become more decisive? How do we get divine direction. What I want to talk about today is trusting God's process. Trusting God's process. And I want to read to you from what gets to my favorite verse in Scripture. If you said, Craig, what's your one life verse? We're going to get to it at the end of this message. Trusting God's process. And let me give you the context of Acts chapter 20, where we're going to be. Uh, Paul is talking about this very uh, emotional decision that he had to make. Paul um, loved where he was in Ephesus. Uh, The people were his people. This was his place. He felt at home here. He could have spent the rest of his life doing what he was doing. He was very, very happy. Then he felt prompted by God to leave where he was and to go somewhere else. And so he called the elders of the church in and explained, God is moving me on. And he had this very emotional farewell with them because he loved where he was, but God was calling him somewhere else. And this is what happened in Acts 20, verses 22 through 24. Uh, Paul says this. He says, and now, compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Four steps in God's process. And what I'm gonna show you in this process is something you will see over and over and over again in your life as you, a Jesus follower, follow the promptings of the Spirit of God. Four steps, trust God's process. The first one, if you're taking notes, is what I call the Spirit's prompting. The Spirit's prompting. Acts 20, 22 says this, and now compelled by the Spirit, Paul says, I love it where I am, but God's calling me to go somewhere else. Compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem. Uh, The Greek words translated as to compelled by the Spirit are the words deo honuma, deo honuma. Deo means uh, wrapped, it's like with a cord that's pulling you in a direction. Numa is spirit or breeze, or current. Ho is the girl your mama warned you about. I'm just kidding, I don't, I don't even know what ho is. Deo, sorry, I'm just, I'm just, you know, if you're gonna have, come to church, you might as well have fun. De, deo honuma, it's, it's bound, it's the cord that's pulling you, it's bound by the breeze of the spirit. I love it where I am, but I'm experiencing something that's pulling me in another direction, it's a little bit like uh, I really work hard to eat healthy. And probably four years ago, I totally, radically, completely changed my diet, and I, I just, I really rarely eat junk food until my godly, awesome, almost perfect wife brings home cinnamon rolls. <laughs> hot cinnamon rolls. Hot, big cinnamon rolls. Hot, big, anointed, powerful, spirit filled. <laughs> cinnamon rolls, and I'm trying to walk by them, and there's this like cinema power. There's like, I'm walking, I'm walking by them, and it's this deo, I mean, I'm pulled back, and so you know how it goes. One bite, one bite, one roll. Later on, Amy comes in, where are the cinnamon rolls? I'm in a corner on a sugar high with icing all over, I don't know, 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 okay? I'm sorry, I'm just trying to work through it, okay? Deo honuma, it's, 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 and now I love it where I am. I wasn't seeking this out, but I'm compelled by the Spirit. And I want to tell you, if you're a Jesus follower, you have to be on guard and aware and watch for the Deo honuma moments. It could be something really, really big 
where the Spirit redirects your life. It could be something very seemingly insignificant that impacts in, in having a bigger impact. For me, it was 21 years ago when I loved where I was, loved my pastor, loved my church, and now, compelled by the Spirit, we must start a different kind of church. It's big and life-directing. It was the other day when I was about to text someone that was hurting, and it was Deo Honuma. Don't text, call, call. And what turned into what was a momentary call ended up being a lot of tears and a significant amount of prayer and an incredibly meaningful conversation. Watch out for the Deo Honuma moments. You will experience them in big ways, in seemingly insignificant ways, but every time the Spirit of God prompts you, it's always important. Deo Honuma. Some of you, it will be Deo Honuma. You've been prompted to get out of your comfort zone and to fellowship with other believers in a small group, in a life group. God's been talking to you for a long time and now compelled by the Spirit. Some of you, it will be serving somewhere. Deo Honuma, the Spirit leads you to use your gifts to make a difference. Deo Honuma, to start a business one day. Deo Honuma, to start a ministry one day. Deo Honuma, to write a book one day. Deo Honuma, sweetheart, God's calling you to upgrade your low-class boyfriend. He wants something better. And then you may be the up-class upgrade guy. You're looking at her, she's three seats down. Then you gotta ask her out. That's your Deo Honuma. Don't miss your opportunity or she may get away. And when you say, hey, you want to study the Bible together? And she looks at you funny and says, how about coming to my life group? And then you meet her and you connect and you have a kid. Please name your kid Craig. Someone has to do it because <laughs> my name is dying and I can feel it. I can feel it. It's like there's Leonard and Velma and Craig. I can feel it. It's like, don't let it die. Somebody. Shiloh, Ladasha. Where's Craig? Give me a Craig. Somebody. Deo Honuma. Who knows, you might be prompted to call your kid Craig. How did I get a name that's dying? Anybody know, a, like, a, anyone under 10 named Craig? <laughs> Spirit's prompting. Spirit's prompting. Paul says this, and now, compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem. Trust God's process. The first thought in God's process is the Spirit's prompting. The second, if you're taking notes, is what I call certain uncertainty. Certain uncertainty. Then Paul says this. He says, compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem. And then he says, not knowing what will happen to me there. I know I'm called to go, but I don't know any details at all. So often what we want in life is we want details. God, show me the details. It's like the old movie, A Few Good Men, when Jack Nicholson says, you want the truth? You can't handle the truth, okay? I think sometimes we say, God, I want details. And God says, you want details? He wouldn't say it like that. He says it lovingly. <laughs> you want details, my child? You can't handle the details, my child, or whatever. You know, I really think that that's true. We want details, but God doesn't give us details, uh, honestly. Honestly, when Amy and I started the church, I wanted so many details. How and when and what and how's this going and where and how, Listen, if God had shown me all the details, including all the pain, there's no way, no way we would have said yes. On the other side now, when we see the impact, there's no way we would ever say no. There's no way. What he had to do was, was lead us step by step as we could handle it. But our faith was not yet prepared to handle the trials that were to come. I want details. It's not time for details. In fact, I love what Psalm says that uh, is so powerful to me. Psalm 119, verses 105, that your word, God's word, is a lamp to guide my feet. It's a light for my path. What is God's word? It's a, it's a lamp to guide our feet. It's, it's not a spotlight to the future. It's a light to our path. It's, it, what do we want? God, I want to know steps four, five, and six. God's going to say, I'm not going to show you four, five, and six until you take one, two, and three. 
but I want to plan my life. No, the Lord determines your steps. I know that I'm called to go, but I don't understand the details. Show me the details. All I'm going to do is show you the next step, certain uncertainty. Sometimes people ask me as a leader, now, Craig, what's your plan for the future of the church? And let me tell you, my philosophy of leadership has changed significantly. What's your plan? My plan is rarely about the future. My plan is to be obedient today. Say it again. My plan is rarely about the future. My plan is to be obedient today. I cannot see the future, but I can be faithful to take the next step. But I want certainty. I want certainty. You want certainty? Here's some certainty. God will never leave you. He will never forsake you. God will guide you step by step. Remember our verse last week? God will advise you, God will guide you, and God will watch over you. But I need more certainty. Listen, if you're not living with a little uncertainty every now and then, you are not living by faith. And if you're not living by faith, you cannot please God. All I know is I'm being compelled by the Spirit. Spirit's prompting, certain uncertainty. The third part of God's process is what I call predictable resistance. Predictable resistance. Mark it down on your calendar. Your enemy will resist what God leads you to do. This is what Paul says. All I know is I'm being prompted. I don't know what's gonna happen there. I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. Prison and hardships. Prison for serving Jesus. Prison. We read through that and think no big deal. What if you like witnessed at work and they came in and locked you up and took you and put you away for four years? That's what we're talking about. I only know if I serve Jesus, sometimes it will be very, very difficult. We have to understand, if you are not ready to face opposition for your obedience to God, you are not ready to be used by God. Let me say it again. If you don't ever think it's ever going to be difficult when you do something significant by faith, you're kidding yourself. Virtually everything significant that we did that matters was met with resistance. All the way down, and I've told you this story 50 times before, but you have to understand, when I was trying to be ordained in the early years, I was rejected for ordination. I was rejected for ordination. Why do you think I was rejected? Yes, I was probably young and arrogant, but there was also an enemy who was trying to talk me out of what God was gonna lead us to one day do. When we started the church, there was more resistance than you could ever imagine. Why another church? Why another church? Why another church? When we attempted video teaching, we were called heretic, loser, that will never work. Now, people drive in and fly in from other states to see me live and tell me two things every time. Number one, we like you better on video. Number two, you're much smaller in person than we expected, both of which are rude. Quit saying that and just go back to your video campus and enjoy it better there. I mean, it's all over anything significant that we do is gonna be met with resistance. Personally, when we had six kids, you wouldn't believe. Like, do you know what causes that? Yes, we do. And we're unwilling to give it up. And all God's people said, amen and amen. You have to understand, we grew up before there was Netflix and we were madly in love. That's why we had, you know, we home educate our kids. You wouldn't believe the controversy. They're gonna be weird. Yes, that's the goal. We've seen normal. <laughs> Everything significant you do will be met with resistance. Here's a big problem today. So many people, whenever things get tough, they start to think, well, God must not be in on this. When do you think your enemy attacks? Is it when you're not doing anything for the glory of God? No, your enemy attacks when you are. Resistance is not necessarily a sign that you're out of God's will. Resistance is often a sign that you're doing exactly what God called you to do. Feel that, let me say it again, let it soak in, let it soak in. Just because things aren't going right, doesn't necessarily mean you're out of God's will. Whenever you're being attacked, that may be a direct indication that you're doing exactly what it is that God called you to do. What happened? The struggle that you're having today is developing the spiritual strength that you need tomorrow. Trust God's process. Trust God's process. Spiritual prompting. 
certain uncertainty, predictable resistance. It's not always going to go easy. Now, before we look at the fourth phase, what I want to do is I want to talk a little bit more about the life of the Apostle Paul. I know that there would be some that maybe, you know, aren't church people, and so you may not know the backstory. but Paul, the end of the story is, was one of the greatest spiritual leaders in the history of the world. I mean, you got to put him up, like, probably somewhere outside of Jesus, and then kind of Paul, and, you know, that's, that's kind of where he is. And, and in, in the early days, before Paul was a follower of Jesus, he was actually probably the most dangerous persecutor of Jesus' followers of his day. This guy killed Christians. He ordered the stoning of Christians. He hated everything about Christians. If you're not a Jesus follower and you hate Christians, you would have loved this guy. He was, you know, you, you would have loved him. And he meets Christ and has this powerful conversion. I mean, it's like, boom, in a moment, just like some of you today, in a moment, your life is completely transformed. And that's what he has. And so a lot of people think, well, then all of a sudden, he got to do exactly what he wanted to do. He got to do what he was passionate about. He got to make a difference. And he got to make a buttload of money. Because isn't that what God wants for all of us, right? It's got to be just like we want it. It's our calling, our career, our passion. Certainly, that's what he got. Not so fast. You would think he was off to the races, but again, some of this is a little fuzzy, but here's what appears happened to him. It looks like right after he became a Jesus follower, he spent three quiet years in obscurity in Arabia, most likely kind of studying, wanting to preach. Hey, hey, can I preach? Not this month. Hey, hey, can I preach? Not this month. Hey, 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 three months. Can I preach? Not this month. Three years or so goes by, and we know he preaches in Damascus. His first sermon is so good, they all try to kill him. That's what happened. Now, how's that for a great start to your ministry? That's your television ministry's off. Now they're trying to kill you, you know? They're coming at you with knives and knives and bows and arrows or whatever. So he runs for his life. He's struggling to pay the bills. A lot of time goes by. He wants to preach, but what's he doing? He's actually making tents. He's making tents. Some of you right now, in your world, you're making tents. You want to do something else, but you're making tents. About eight years or so goes by. He still wants to preach. Nobody wants the guest speaker who killed Christians. We heard he's changed, but I'm not putting him up at my church right now because we love living, right? <laughs> and so finally, Barnabas kind of vouches for this guy and gives him some credibility. And then the door starts opening after what? Studying, waiting, praying, trying to preach, running, making tents, making more tents, making boring tents, wanting to preach, waiting, waiting, waiting. Trust God's process. Trust God's process. Trust God's process. He's doing something in you because he wants to do something through you. Trust God's process. He's doing something in you because he wants to do something through you. You got to get the who right before the do shows up. You got to become who he wants you to be so you can do what he wants you to do. Spirits prompting certain uncertainty predictable resistance, and then number four, uncommon confidence. Uncommon confidence. If there's one verse that is my favorite in all of Scripture, this is my life verse. Uncommon confidence. Let me summarize before I read the verse. Here's what Paul says. Hey, I love it where I am. Ephesus is a great place, but I've been prompted by the Spirit. Deo honuma. I know that I'm supposed to go to Jerusalem. I don't know what's going to happen to me there, certain uncertainty. I do know it's going to be difficult, predictable resistance, but I have uncommon confidence. He says this. He says, even though there's going to be bad and difficult times, and even though I don't know the details, he says, however, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. My only goal is to finish the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. I consider my life worth nothing to me if only I can serve Jesus exactly where I am. Going forward, what did the Apostle Paul do? He wrote the biggest 
portion of the New Testament that we have today, God's inspired word that changes our lives. He started churches across Asia Minor and Europe. How did he do all this? How did he make such an eternal difference? Don't miss this. Paul did not have a plan for the future. He had a plan to obey the Spirit today. He didn't have a plan mapped out with his five-year long-term, and then we're going to all, 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 all. He had some things that he hoped for, but he followed the Spirit's prompting every single day. I was happy, and now God's moved step by step. I don't know the details. I know it's not going to be easy, but I am certain that God wants me to glorify Jesus wherever I am. If I'm preaching to a big crowd, I'm gonna talk about Jesus. If I'm locked up in prison, I'm gonna write about Jesus. If I'm locked up to a prison guard, I'm gonna lead him to Jesus. If they're beating me and leaving me for dead, I'm calling out on Jesus. Why? Because I am absolutely and completely confident that it's not all about my career, but I have a heavenly calling to glorify Jesus everywhere that I am. How does this apply to you? Well, well you know, where am I supposed to be? What, what about my passion? What about my, 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 my calling? Man, if you're making tents, serve Jesus making tents. If you're waiting tables, serve Jesus waiting tables. If you're a stay-at-home mom, serve Jesus as a stay-at-home mom. If you're, if you're a graduate student, serve Jesus there. Well, how am I gonna get from here to where I wanna be? You don't even know if where you wanna be is where God wants you to be. People tell me all the time, they ask me, did you, know, did you envision this with Life Church? Are you smoking the funny weed? I didn't envision anything close to this, nothing close to this, nothing close to this. Nothing. If I told you what I envisioned, you would laugh. In fact, you wanna make God laugh? Tell him your plans, because God has plans that are exceedingly, abundantly more than you can ask, think, or imagine according to his power that is at work within you that he would be glorified through the church for generations to come. What do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? Who do you want me to be? Who do you want me to be? When we get the who right, God will lead us to the do. When we get the why right, it's easier to discern the what. We don't have to just plan the future. We're obedient to the next step today. This is what's so cool about Paul. In the early days, he's like so many people in this generation. What are we about? Let's be honest. What are we about? Me. Right? Let's be honest. Let's call it what it is. What do we want to make? Let's make a name for ourselves. Why? Because it's all about me. Then he progressed. Let's not make a name. Let's make a difference. Then it wasn't about me, but it was about we. I need Barnabas, and we need Peter, and together we can do this. Then one day, it wasn't, let's make a name. Let's make a difference. It wasn't about me. It wasn't about we. Listen, it was all about Jesus. And when it was all about Jesus, he didn't make a name for himself. He didn't just make a difference in this world. He made history for the glory of God. And the reason, thank you for the polite golf clap, (laughs) that you're not standing up and cheering and going crazy because you may not believe that it's really possible because it's still so much about us. But when, and this is why this is my favorite verse, because I have to be honest, it's not always true about me but I want it to be always true about me. I want it to be always true about me. That the Spirit prompts me to be led by God. I don't know what's going to happen. Certain uncertainty. But I've got faith. It's impossible to please God without faith. Predictable resistance. That's part of it. It's part of it. It gets difficult and we suffer sometimes as Jesus followers. Get over your wine and put on your big boy panties and get back in the game. (laughs) Uncommon confidence. And this is where I want to live. I know he's leading me. I know we're supposed to do something. It's not about we. It's not even just about, it's never about me, but it's all about Jesus. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. If only I can, wherever I am, make intense, 
making babies, making money, making whatever, wherever I am, whatever you do, you do it for the glory of Jesus. And when you get to that point, what happens? You don't have to worry so much about the future. You just have to be obedient today. And when you're obedient today, you're not worried about missing out on something because you're doing exactly what God wants you to do. And you trust that he will lead you to where he wants to lead you so your life will glorify him. And that's how you discern divine direction. Step by step, we make our plans. The Lord determines our steps. All of our churches pray. And Father, we ask that in your presence, you would lead us, guide us, empower us step by step. All of our churches reflecting in prayer today, those who would say, I am a Jesus follower, and I want to be even more sensitive to the Deo Honuma moments. I want to be sensitive to when the Holy Spirit prompts me. I want to sense him. I want to respond. I want to know when God is prompting me. All of our churches, would you raise your hands right now? Lift them up, lift them up, lift them up. You can put them down for a minute. Father, I thank you that you are the guide. Jesus is the good shepherd who guides the sheep. We will follow your voice. I thank you that you are a speaking God. You speak through your word. You speak by your spirit. You speak through people. You speak through circumstances. God, we can hear and discern your voice and follow your will. Guide us, God. Prompt us.